Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Davis, Professor of English and Director of the May 4th Visitor Center. And I'm here today with my colleague, Carol Barbado, who is a Professor of Communication Studies. And together, we coordinated the creation of the May 4th Visitor Center, which the university formally dedicates this May 4th. We welcome all of you who experienced and were deeply touched by May 4th and those of you who feel a strong bond to what happened on our campus 43 years ago. And we are truly thankful that you're here with us today. Thank you. Quoting poet Joseph Brodsky, historian Jay Winter, noted to the Kent State community that the past won't fit into memory without something left over. It must have a future. On that same occasion, Holocaust scholar Roman Serbin defined collective memory as what people as a collection make of their past history in order to serve the future. Tonight, we dedicate an important milestone in what Kent State makes of its past on May 4th, 1970, the wounding of nine Kent State students and the tragic loss of Allison Krauss, Jeffrey Miller, Sandra Scheuer, and William Schroeder. In telling their story, we honor their loss and we serve the future by providing a place for reflection on the enduring meaning of May 4th, its place in history. The May 4th Visitor Center was created through a long and extensive consultative process. Over the past six years, we at Kent State have worked with national experts, our Kent State colleagues, consultants, community leaders, and students, thousand in all, to develop a content for the exhibit. You'll see in the program the many of those thousands of people who have contributed to this project. And if we could, we would like to thank them all by name, but we don't have the time to do so. We do wish to make recognition to the May 4th Task Force, who over the past 43 years have taken part in remembering the four students who lost their lives and keeping the memory of Kent State alive through their annual May 4th commemorations. We want you to know that the first time President Lefton heard about the idea of a May 4th Visitor Center, he understood and affirmed its value. He has been highly supportive throughout this very extensive process that Carol described and that brings us here tonight. And please join us in welcoming Kent State President Lester Lefton. Well, it's another extraordinary day at Kent State. Good evening, everyone. It's my privilege to join you in this long-awaited day. I wanted to start uh, by saluting and thanking the driving forces that we know as Laura Davis and Carolyn Barbado. Each, of course, was a student here in 1970. Each became a respected member of our faculty, and each was instrumental in creating the world-class facility that we dedicate formally today. Like them, Many of you are here because you were touched deeply and indelibly by the history that happened here 43 years ago. You understand its profound impact on our university, on our country, and on our world. You want to honor the promising lives lost on May 4th, Allison Krauss, Jeffrey Miller, Sandra Scheuer, and William Schroeder. You want to remember the nine students whose lives were altered the minute they were wounded. And you see the wisdom in the quiet but powerful call to action inscribed on the May 4th memorial. Inquire, learn, and reflect. The call was answered by many in our community. Some were compelled to do much more. They made a strong case for adding the May 4th site to the National Register of Historic Places and they pursued the creation of a permanent site for recounting the lives and the events surrounding May 4th, placing them in political and cultural contexts 
and for reinforcing democratic values that seemed so lost in the May 4th, 1970 events. Peaceful conflict resolution, freedom of speech, and respect for a diversity of views regardless of where they may come from. The Visitor Center does all of that and more. It's a place where we welcome alumni and others who feel forever connected to the May 4th site. They see it not as a physical landmark, but a landmark in their lives. It's a place where we welcome scholars and visitors, students and others. They see the value in exploring an event in the view of many historians, one that hastened the end of America's most controversial of wars. And the center is a place to welcome countless other visitors from across America and across the world. They will arrive as curious tourists. I often have people stop me and say, where's the May 4th Visitor Center? Do, do you have a memorial? Where is it? We have not only a memorial, but an education center, a visitor center that is profound, beautifully designed, well executed, and we hope that they leave as informed, perhaps, and inspired as understanding the, May, the facts of May 4th and the lessons our world still needs to hear. We also hope that they delve into the past. Visitors are impressed by Kent State today. As they, as they look at the past, they have to look at where Kent State has come, where it's been, and indeed where it's going. Our commitments to excellence and inclusion are reflected in every corner of the center and of our campus. Those commitments were tested many times as we met the challenges for creating a world-class center. It took six years of exhausted and often exhausting efforts by faculty, staff, students, alumni, and other community members. Literally thousands of individuals contributed their talents, perspectives, and financial support. In the end, their efforts were rewarded in ways that affirm Kent State's pivotal place in history, in their own history, in an important place in, in this university's annals. The May 4th site was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2010. The standard period before a site is considered for the register is 50 years. The May 4th site was added after 40 years. The following year, the National Endowment for the Humanities awarded a $350,000 grant to Kent State for support of the center. Universities really see NEH awards with that many zeros. I hope you've had the chance to see the end result of these achievements and the passion behind them. To visit the center is to be transported to one of the most turbulent and indeed transformational events of our time. It will help answer the questions of why, why here? For many of us, it will also trigger a flood of memories. The music, the fashion, the vernacular. You might leave saying, what a faro trip this has been. I put it this way. <laughs> I, I put it this way. What a highly challenging, highly collaborative, and highly rewarding journey we've taken together. And it has indeed been a trip, an intellectual trip, an emotional trip, a trip to the past, a trip to the present, and hopefully a trip that gives us insight to the future. I'm honored to have been part of that journey. I'm proud that it helped build unity between the university and the city that we love and that we call home. And right now, I'm also delighted to represent, to introduce one of our representatives uh, in the the government of the state of Ohio, Representative the Honorable Kathleen Clyde. Thank you, President Lefton. I am delighted and honored to share this historic moment with the people of Kent, the students, faculty, and administration of Kent State University, and our distinguished visitors. I have here with me a commendation from the Ohio House of Representatives commemorating the official opening of the May 4 Visitor Center, which I will share with you now. It reads, 
On behalf of the members of the House of Representatives of the 130th General Assembly of Ohio, we are pleased to congratulate Kent State University on the occasion of the opening of its new May 4 Visitor Center. Recognition of this special event is a fitting tribute to Kent State University, for it has played a vital role in preserving the events of the past while preparing countless students to meet the challenges of the future. On May 4, 1970, protesters gathered on the KSU campus to oppose the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War, but the Ohio National Guard troops who had been called out to restore order fired into the crowd, killing four students and wounding nine others, and the May 4 Visitor Center commemorates the events of this pivotal day. The spirit of our nation is founded upon and reflected in its momentous and meaningful past, and the memorializing of significant landmarks and events is vital to the preservation of America's heritage. All those involved with the opening of the Kent State University May 4 Visitor Center, including its director, Laura Davis, are to be applauded for their tremendous efforts to ensure that the important details of our past are transmitted to the succeeding generations for their reflection and appreciation. Thus, with heartfelt appreciation, we commend Kent State University on its new May 4 Visitor Center and extend best wishes for the future. Thank you. My name is Roger DiPaolo, and I'm editor of the Record Courier in Kent. Kent, Ohio is my hometown, and I'm a proud graduate of Kent State University. May 4th, 1970 is a double touchstone for me, as it is for so many who are proud to call Kent their home. We remember not only a date in American history, and the passing of two generations has affirmed without any doubt its importance in our nation's story, but we also remember a turning point in the history of this community. May 4th, 1970 is my hometown's 9-11. It's a day that we reduce to emotional shorthand, May 4th. It's a day that is forever in our memory impossible to forget. No community invites tragedy, nor does it welcome being forever linked with it as the people of Oklahoma City, Columbine, Chardon, New York City, Newtown, Connecticut, and now Boston know just as well as the people of Kent, Ohio do. We all share in a moment of history we never th sought, an enduring pain that never goes away, a day that resonates with us no matter how many years pass. If the sun is shining and the sky is blue and filled with spring on this day as it was when we woke up this morning, our thoughts remember a mirror image of a day 43 years ago that seared our souls. We realized that like 9-11, when the morning skies of New York City were crystal clear, darkness can fall abruptly. We remember. We remember our sense of fear, our sense of anger, our sense of betrayal, emotions that even now haunt us. We are not victims, but survivors. And as survivors, we shoulder that burden for the rest of our lives and throughout the rest of our history. The poet Wallace Stevens wrote, the wound kills that does not bleed. We continue to bleed, undoubtedly much less than we did 43 years ago today when young people died and were wounded on this campus and in our hometown. But we do bleed as we continue to struggle to heal. The passing of time brings distance, context, history, and an imperfect sense of healing. The scars fade, but they do not totally vanish, nor should they. We need to be reminded of what caused them. We do not celebrate tragedy when we respectfully acknowledge it, but when we attempt to deny it, we do so at great risk. And so with the dedication of the May 4th Visitor Center, we say we remember. 
We do not celebrate the events whose story it recounts, but we do not shun the details of that story. In a compact space where student journalists were at work 43 years ago as history unfolded literally within sight of their newsroom, we tell the story of May 4th. We tell it simply and factually, leaving it to those who learn it to draw their own conclusions and judgments, which is one of the first lessons I learned as a beginner journalist a few years later in that newsroom at Taylor Hall. We move in the visitor center from room to room, entering through the exuberant cacophony of the 1960s. Loud, brash, full of excitement, energy, color, hope, and conflict. And then we turn the corner, walking into the darkness of that weekend in May. We watch silently as images of the events that made Kent State a national icon unfold. For some of us, the scenes are all too familiar but for others, so very importantly, they are visions of an unknown time. We listen to the voices of key players and say a sol silent prayer of gratitude for the courage of men such as Glenn Frank, who inverted an even greater tragedy that afternoon. We emerge into a room filled with words, so appropriate for a setting where journalists once toiled, recounting the judgments in the aftermath of those events. It's a wall of words, words filled with energy and emotion, words filled with hatred and revulsion, words that heal and words that hurt. And finally, as we end our visit, we see the most important element of the visitor's center, the scene of history itself inviting us to explore, to visit this place whose story has been shared and to draw our own conclusions. We learn, we reflect, we remember. As those of us who have firsthand recollections of the events of May 4th, 1970 grow older, we realize all too well that our memories will not endure forever, that the stories we are able to tell now must somehow survive when our voices fall silent. We realize that the events of May 4th, 1970 are too important to be forgotten as some even now continue to counsel, and even as some on this campus did more than 35 years ago as they sought to literally bury part of that historic site. Their arrogant actions served only to affirm the need to preserve history. The story demands to be told, it cannot be denied. We remember because it is important for the people of Kent, Ohio, for the entire Kent State community to do so. We remember because we must. We remember because we cannot and must not ever forget. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I would like to certainly add my welcome to everyone who is here tonight for what I can guarantee you will be a really interesting evening of conversation. This is an important night at Kent State University as we gather here to dedicate the May 4th Visitor Center, a new critical component of our campus. My name is Gary Hansen. I'm a professor in a school of journalism and mass communication here at Kent State, teaching mostly television students. But I'm also here as a movie buff, and I'm here as an armchair reader of American history. And so I'm really pleased to be your host tonight for what I said I hope will promise to be a really fascinating evening. What makes it fascinating, of course, is the presence of Oliver Stone. For someone who is as in love with both motion pictures and history as I am, being able to share the stage with Oliver Stone really is like going to the top of the mountain. There isn't a film buff or a history buff among us who has not been alternatively intrigued and occasionally infuriated.
by the body of work of this prolific filmmaker. His body of work challenges us. It forces us really to examine some of the basic and major events of the last 50 years. Vietnam, in his critically acclaimed trilogy of films, Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July, and Heaven and Earth. The rise and fall of American leaders is equally as fascinating, with his equally acclaimed body of work that examines the death of one president, JFK, the downfall of another, and his inner demons in the movie Nixon, and the examination of the legacy that has had dramatic consequences for the start of the 21st century in his movie W. He has challenged us to take a critical look at the media, at ourselves as the audience, in his landmark film, Natural Born Killers, and in one that I find particularly interesting, one of my favorites, talk radio. He has examined uniquely American phenomena from Wall Street to professional football. He has given us larger than life characters that live beyond his movies, characters such as Gordon Gecko, who taught all of us that greed, of course, is good. Oliver Stone has embarked now on what may be arguably the most ambitious project of his prolific career, a 10-part series for the Showtime Network that challenges our view of American history itself. The series, called The Untold History of the United States, forces us to confront the conventional wisdom about both our past and our identity. The project, along with its companion book, has its critics, to be sure. But it is just one more piece, I think, in a long and distinguished career that is committed to challenging some of the basic assumptions that we all hold. And what a better place to debate that than in the center of a major American university. It is for that reason that the May 4th Visitor Center has invited him to come to our campus this weekend to help us commemorate the events of May 4th of 1970 and its place in both American and world history, as well as in our own sense of identity. You see, the nation's storytellers are important. They give us a sense of who we are and what we believe and how we define ourselves. And so with all of that as background, we welcome to our stage tonight the noted and award-winning film director and writer Oliver Stone to give us first his perspective on history and memory in film, and after that we'll spend a few minutes talking about his enormous and impressive body of work. Ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award winner Oliver Stone. Welcome to Kent State. Thank you very much. Am I going now? Or do you uh, you'll, you'll hear yeah. and then we'll chat over there. Okay. Okay. Hi. And thank you, Gary. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> really, uh, you went out of your way. And you even watched those 10 hours. That's, uh, I'm most proud of that, the untold history, which I hope you get to see soon. Uh, there's a lot of light in my f on my eyes right here. If you could maybe lower that one a little bit, that might help. And is there a light here? And water. Is there a light up here, by the way? I can't see too much. My handwriting. Excuse me, please. No, that's fine. I'm just talking about here. There's no... You know, I wrote these remarks, so I, my, my biggest obstacle in life is my own handwriting. Uh, when I lose about 20% of what I write in a frenzy. So it's a chicken scrawl, but so be it. Uh, I want to say a few things. Uh, I started slowly to wake up. I was born in 1946. I grew up in the most prosperous New York City society. But like now, 
with much fear in my heart and my mind. Fear of the Russians, our World War II allies. They were coming to our country, our paradise, in a conspiracy along with the Chinese and much of the impoverished world, as well as with our discontented classes, labor agitators, labor union teachers, kooks, people who thought differently, people who couldn't be trusted and were often fired from their jobs as we all informed on each other. They were coming to destroy us, our great country, our way of life. Would never be the same if we allowed that to happen. We had to fight back. We had to. Those of, you know, those of you who know some of my films know perhaps the rest of this story. Boy drops out of college, goes to Vietnam to serve his country, comes out devastated, unsure. Stumbles along, confused, alienated for a few years, and gradually finds his way telling stories of his evolving consciousness. I'm honored that you, at the, after so many years of doing this, have asked me here today to commemorate the lives of four students who fought to understand something they did not understand and lost their lives in what was probably for them in their last moments, devastatingly senseless, shocking, and as violent death tends to be, unexpected. As rows of National Guardsmen, 76 of them, executed a 135 degree about face on a grassy slope not far from here, and 28 of them unleashed a fusillade of up to 70 shots that lasted 13 seconds and left nine wounded and four dead. Very few know what really happened at that moment or why. And to this day, 43 years later, very few still do. Too many memorials are soaked in polite sentimentality and pity. But a memorial means to remember. To remember why and what. What those young people died for. To acknowledge that they did not die for nothing. For the senselessness of that stupid moment of fear and panic. In the spirit of that, You've invited me here to celebrate this memorial as a, quote, enduring dedication to scholarship that seeks to prevent violence and promote democratic values. To learn the lessons of nonviolence, tolerance, and civility. And to reflect on ways to create a more peaceful, more just world. End of quote. Let us then not castrate this meaning, but let us make these words flesh and blood. Let us learn. Let us remember the ferocity of that time. In Platoon, I described a civil war going on in every one of the three combat units that I served in between those who were able to question what, was, what we were forced to do and those who did not question. That same civil war was raging in this country when I returned. It raged through this land from the first protests in Madison, Wisconsin, violent 
nonviolent student protests in Madison, Wisconsin in October 1967. Through the campuses of hundreds of colleges in the aftermath of Nixon's expansion of the war and his bombing and invasion of Cambodia. And it continued after into the 1972 Christmas bombing, the heaviest yet of North Vietnam which came only one month after Nixon's landslide re-election in November 1972 over the peace candidate, Democratic senator from the Dakota, South Dakota, recently deceased, George McGovern. A great American. And it continued, still again, after the peace agreement was signed in Paris with the Vietnamese in January of 1973. It continued with the extensive, secret and not so secret, saturation bombing of Laos and Cambodia. To such a degree that the entire agricultural infrastructure of, a landlo of the landlocked Cambodia was destroyed by Nixon and Kissinger. This is the given backdrop to this day here at Kent State, May 4, 1970. The seed of distrust for its younger generation was laid well before in the conviction in the minds of Lyndon Johnson, J. Edgar Hoover, and Richard Nixon that communism had come here, had come back to roost in the student activist movement and in the civil rights movement too. Files were compiled on hundreds of thousands of American activists and citizens from the early days of the Cold War. These people in, these people, these activists in Nixon's terminology were Bums, a minority of bums, malcontents, subversives, provocateurs, unknowingly, unknowingly financed by Moscow's communist dictators. But remember this, Nixon called it a minority, and he was right. He called his supporters the majority. The moral majority was with him against these students. And you know what? To judge by the results of the 1972 landslide election over McGovern, Nixon was right because he was reelected, just as we reelected George W. Bush in 2004 at the height of his Iraq folly. Can we ask, are we mad as a people? <laughs> perhaps, or perhaps we're scared. Easy to frighten, like kids in the dark, as we once were of communists after World War II, or terrorists after the communists went away. And we needed another ghost. These student protesters, this chaos, hippies, drugs, this pornographic music, wild sex, Jane Fonda, long hair, intellectuals, black revolutionaries, filled that void. Although the truth is these Kent State kids were the most normal of middle Americans, as were most of those who protested. Let us remember now, it was fear and panic that are blind, and a student quickly crossed into a subversive terrorist. And Nixon, instead of giving us the law and order he, vo he vowed in 1968 as his legacy, gave us what? It's opposite, law and disorder. 
His regime ended in so many illegalities for which he finally resigned, it would be impossible to list them here. His attorney general went to jail. Uh, his vice president, even his vice president, was escorted out of the EOB in handcuffs for a separate list of crimes. We must remember the past. That is why we are here. It would not behoove us then to ignore another essential memory of that Black Monday, May 4, 1970. The existence of a student's audio tape made at the time of the shooting. It was turned over to the FBI and eventually destroyed in 1979. But the truth has a way, like water, of creeping through the cracks to the light. And a bona, and a bona fide copy of the audio reemerged in 2007 under the auspices of the Kent State Truth Tribunal. This tape was analyzed by an internationally accredited forensic expert using state-of-the-art technology not available in past investigations. And given the insane parameters of Lyndon Johnson, J. Edgar Hoover, and Richard Nixon's behavior in those years, we should have no reason to doubt what it reveals. U.S. government informers and provocateurs were spread wide doing their dirty work, whether in Vietnam or Ohio. Here at Kent State was one known shady provocateur with previous links to the FBI, Terry Norman. This tape demonstrates two things. That one, there was a command to fire at the student protesters. And two, there were four pistol shots fired some 70 seconds before the command, which have been identified as coming from an FBI informant's pistol. It was a botched signal, I suppose, to create the sound of sniper fire as if a student or students were firing at the guardsmen. There is nothing overly shocking to me in any of this information, nor in my mind anything too difficult for our supposedly sanitized minds to absorb and bear witness to. But as we see again and again in our untold history, it is really only one more shameful moment in our government's long, long history of lying, violence, and repression. What difference really in the end is, is there between four innocent students here and three and a half to 3.8 million Vietnamese slaughtered in our war there, or throw in another million Cambodians and Laotians for good, for good measure, and you have close to five million Indochina dead in a holocaust we escalated and were primarily responsible for. How many died in the Holocaust in Europe? Everyone, everyone knows six million. And then how many students of this day in our schools know how many Indo-Chinese died? You ask, they say, often, I don't know, a few hundred thousand, a million maybe. Five million is a statistic, hard to grasp. A recent Gallup poll revealed that 51% of American young people, 21 to 35, think of Vietnam now as a good war, a justified war. 
the memory of man must be preserved to prevent it from decay, to preserve the very fragile thread of civilization, decency, of just, hey, dude, relax. We have a long, America, we have a long, long path of atonement ahead of us on which we must meet our true history and learn humbly that the only way forward is not, as President Obama said, to turn our backs on the past, but to come clean with our history, to come clean with the past. To deny is death. Disavowal is death. Only the truth can make us free. Those kids protested and died at Kent State because they suspected as much. May we not insult them further by denying the cause of their fates. Let us not paper over our words with easy forgiveness for all sides. Instead, let us condemn the government that does this to us, and still to this day does it abroad in the name of fighting a global war on terrorism, in a disguise in the form of dominating all international situations as much as we can with our military actions or by our media and our government officials declaring our right to judge other nations. Let us also pour shame on the government of Ohio at that time under James Rhodes. <laughs> and on the National Guard of that time under General Canterbury. This monument stands to the memory of those who fought and gave their lives for real peace, not more lies. Join me in a moment of silence and prayer for the memory of Alison Krauss, Jeffrey Miller, Sandra Schur, and William Schroeder, and bless them for their sacrifice. Welcome again to Kent State. We are honored to have you. And thank you for those remarks. Thank I you. think that, that really helps sort of put this into the sense of perspective that we'd like to talk about tonight. Um, and I want to talk a lot about Vietnam. But before we get to that, I'd like you to give us your sense of how the country is different now than it was in the 70s in terms of its attitudes, in terms of, its, of what it thinks is important, because I think that, that that context of where the country is has a lot to do with how we understand this. Can we lower the lights just a little bit? It's like six are right in my eyes. Yeah. I know. It's, Thank you. So I'd love to see the audience <laughs> yeah. and have a more of an interactive. Uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah. You know, my first instinct was to say to you, Gary, uh, no. I don't see much of a difference because it was hyper-violent back then and very sensitive, very polarized. The, uh, the differences were, killing, were worth killing for. If there was a wonderful movie made by Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda called Easy Rider in 1960. Yes. 69. 69. Oh, yeah. and, and, the reason it succeeded it was because it went to the edge and it showed you just how far 
one group of people would go to enforce their values and their way of life. And it was a bloody ending, a murder of the, uh, Han, uh, of the two boys. Uh, that was how bad it was. So right. there's no comparison in that sense of how dangerous it was for those kids to do what they did and for protesters in general. And the, the thing about now uh, that I can see as a veteran and, is the hypervigilance, hypervigilance. It is as if to say the Nixon people did win. Right. The Hoover people did win. They have now imposed a global, global, not national, security state on us with cameras everywhere, enforcing, uh, forcing allies to sign up on our bill to agree with us and to pursue, quote, terrorists, <coughs> troublemakers everywhere in the globe. What we see now is conformity on another scale that I never could have dreamed of. I suppose the 1950s was worse because everyone had to agree and it was hard to get a job if you didn't agree. You would be run out of your job. It was a horrible time in the 1950s. Don't, under, don't ever underestimate it. Not just because of McCarthy. McCarthy was a, a dramatic extreme. It was horrible because of the neutral person in the, who did nothing and who was scared and who informed. It was horrible because Dwight Eisenhower and Harry Truman were our leaders and they did, Truman did a little something, but Dwight Eisenhower did nothing. So that was what's horrible. And it's this consensus. And now in this day and age with 2001 doing what it did to our psyche, uh, whatever reason, right. I don't know why it was violent and all that, but for some reason it made us even more scared. We've given these rights away to the government to do whatever they want because, frankly, we can't seem to do anything about it. Uh, when the Boston Marathon thing happened, uh, you know, one could argue, I think, very, very uh, rationally that these people could have been uh, rounded up through regular police work. There would have been photos at the finish line, as there always were after races. There would have been a good chance they would have been found. But we applauded, most of us, uh, the, national, the security state we've imposed, the homeland security. We applauded all the, the coverage. These, these eager beaver uh, news reporters were all over the air telling us, gee, look how this homeland security that costs $50 billion a year, it really works. <laughs> Do you notice that anyone noticed that they locked down the entire city to chase yeah. two people? Did it not bother some of you? Like, it's scary. It was like night of the living dead. They're imposing martial law. Uh, as they see fit, to chase who they mm -hmm. see fit. And I don't think it warranted that. I don't think martial law is ever warranted unless you're really into a dire situation. It's but it's too easy yeah. to do that. Yeah. Fascinating cover story, by the way, this week in Time Magazine just came out today that really looks at the, at the trade-off that we're making between security and privacy, and it really gets to the point that you're talking about. I'm sorry, Gary, I gave up yeah. reading Time Magazine <laughs> long, long ago. <laughs> Well, somehow we get, we get two of them at our house, so I'd be happy to, to give you one of them so, uh, so you can catch up. Uh, I'm, I'm too aware of Henry Luce yeah. and his how was, how was your worldview influenced by your time in Vietnam? Well, people keep asking me like I was radicalized over there, but I wasn't. Uh, I was simply shocked, uh, disgusted. And it takes yeah. time for war crimes, things that you do, things yeah. that settle in. You don't. You know, I did not understand the scope of the bombing. All this comes out in the 1970s, 80s, and even now. McNamara, who was our Secretary of Defense, went to Hanoi in the 90s and was shocked to hear that 3.8 was the actual number of Vietnamese killed. Mm -hmm. Our biggest issue after the war, as you remember, was one, getting the MIAs back. There was about 1,000 right. plus of them. And our second biggest issue was Ronald Reagan's amnesia, which was to simply say that what do we have to be ashamed about? It was a good war. It was a justified war. The Vietnam Syndrome, they called it. That is to say, the Vietnam Syndrome was described by the Pentagon as a syndrome of weakness of American people being unwilling to tolerate foreign intervention. One could really argue, though, that after 40-some years, uh, that the national debate over Vietnam, at least for some people, is really shaped by your films. Is shaped well, by not at fifty-one percent of the yeah. young people. Twenty. Uh, because uh, I mean, 
Platoon really, I, I had somebody describe to me one time, said that, that they thought that, that Platoon was as, as an accurate description of their time in Vietnam as they, as they had seen. Um, fascinating piece of film work. Talk a bit about how you think that helps us in our national consciousness remember Vietnam. It's crucial. Uh, the, the, uh, George Bush, the father, said the, uh, the, the uh, Vietnam syndrome lies buried in the sands of Arabia. It's a great quote, mm -hmm. uh, something out of Lawrence of Arabia. But uh, we, neglect, we, we don't pay attention to the details often, and we forget. And we go into it in history, untold history, quite right. a bit. Is that George Bush honestly put 500,000 troops into the Middle East. This was a huge new Vietnam. And it started a jihad. It started a sense of dislocation in our country and all throughout the Middle East. It went through his son's regime and even Obama's to this day. We have a completely destabilized Middle East. Why did George Bush put 500,000 troops in uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? Now, you're told because Hussein invaded Kuwait which is one, one, certainly one surface reason. But look deeper, look deeper, and see what our objectives were. Please see, uh, I don't have time to debate it all, but chapter, right. chapter nine of the uh, untold history deals specifically with the Kuwait issue. And the way George Bush manipulated uh, the, uh, the media, he had that girl, the, uh, the daughter of the ambassador of Kuwait, who was on testifying in Congress that she was in this hospital in Kuwait when the Iraqi troops rushed in and bayoneted the babies mm -hmm. and threw them up in the air and all that. And she was literally, and it was quoted by Bush over and over again. And he constantly referenced Hussein as Hitler. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who should have, who fought in World War II, he should have known better. But you see how the language, the currency is devalued when you can start to compare Saddam Hussein to, to Adolf Hitler, who was a true uh, geo geopolitical threat to the world. So back to Vietnam. Though. No, but and, it's important and, that okay. we, the yeah. media, swallowed it whole and reported it whole. And then when it came out months later that it was too late, you see. And that's what the media keeps doing. They swallow the, 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 the company story. Uh, whether it's the Boston Marathon or the Kuwait, it goes on and on. We have a media that is dumb and asleep. They do not go further because they're, they are not allowed to. Why? They're smart men. Some of them are very investigative. I've met many of them. They're trying. They really are, some of them. They go out to Somalia, Sudan, Kuwait. They, they dig. But their editors back home, who are often compromised, change the story, cut the story. They don't get the play. That's what Time Magazine was most famous for, was having editors rewrite the story. So the problem does lie in our communication, yeah. in what we as people, we don't know. We are kept in ignorance by the news and by the overall media. So. So who tells? <laughs> so whose job is it then to tell the real story about Vietnam? Well, you're a journalist. <laughs> I don't know that I'll admit that at the moment, but well, you uh, should write about the Kent State um, thing. I mean, it's hard because yeah, your editor I mean, will probably cut you down. Seriously, I mean, you know, the, 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 there's a real. Um, body of knowledge there that needs to be transmitted, yeah. needs to be understood, needs to be interpreted. Right. And not um, embedded. Journalists cannot be embedded in the military. And that is bullshit. They and, have to have a separate. Yeah. And one could argue that, that an entire generation's view of that conflict is shaped in part by your films, right? Well, you say so. I, you know, I, I have less faith in my uh, impact, but or, it's nice or, to know. Or, or at least exposed <laughs> to it. Maybe, maybe influenced is my term, not yours. But, Thank but, you. but that's if nothing else, that's their entree into this, yeah, into this world, right? Yeah. Well, they were separate. They were films that stood apart. I mean, we'd had Rambo, if you remember, uh, Stallone uh, was running all over Vietnam and getting the MIAs back, killing the the gooks uh, w without much conscience. He was also later seen in Afghanistan chasing down the Soviets and, and buddying up with the Mujahideen right. and uh, killing uh, Russians. And then he was, he's an equal opportunity offender, of course, but he was <laughs> later seen in, in his old age uh, uh, routing out Venezuela and the, uh, the Red Beret mm -hmm. leader of uh, Venezuela, a tin pot dictator who uh, Stallone took care of. In, in The Expendables, and that made a fortune. All these films made a fortune. Chuck, Moore, Chuck Norris has made far more money than I've ever made uh, selling you this bullshit. So, 
let's which I might add. Yeah, let's let's keep yeah. things you know in yeah. in perspective here. Uh, my films have had some yeah. impact with people who perhaps like to think for themselves and like to perhaps yeah. experience uh, another point of view. Which of your films are you the most proud of? Of that? Of I that never answer that question because I take it very personally. They're all my children. I worked as hard on the yeah. on the ones that didn't do well as I did on the ones. that Having did well. said that, let me ask you the question again. <laughs> um, which one do you think is the most? Personal to you. I mean, obviously, Platoon. They say is 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 autobiographical. Is is that the one? Semi autobiographical. Yeah. Is is no, the is the closest. Yeah, you could say that was personal. Certainly, that was personal. Yeah. <laughs> that was personal. And in some ways, you know, I know this is a stretch, but uh, Alexander, uh, the 2007 version, the uh, revised version, yeah. three hours and 45 minutes, was close to uh, my feelings about my parents, and it's about that torture tension between parent and child, father, both strong mother and father, both strong, fighting each other. So do we have a sense, you think, as, uh, as well, maybe this audience here is not the, the best example of that, but in the general public, do we have a sense, you think, collectively of what Vietnam was about? Or have we conveniently I forgotten? Th have we? I think if the younger people are not paying attention and they believe Reagan and Bush and Clinton, Clinton also said that the war was carried out with great dignity. And Obama, when the troops returned from Iraq, made the most nauseous speech uh, at the, yeah. one of the uh, forts in South North Carolina saying, we have always fought for the interests of others. We have not fought for our own gain about the Vietnam War. So, uh, you know, as long as, we to as long as we do not pay witness to the truth, is we, cannot, we, we are in denial. There is, as I said, a long path to atonement ahead. Where can this go? Can we lie to ourselves? Germany lied to itself until it went obliterated. Japan lied to itself and it was obliterated. How long can a society lie to itself? Now, the history shows us that six or seven empires collapsed in the 20th century. Uh, the English Empire was over, the, the French, the Dutch, the Soviet Empire twice. Mm -hmm the Chinese. Empires don't last. We have fallen in love with our empire. After communism fell in 1991, there was absolutely no reason, not a fig leaf, fig leaf left to maintain NATO and this steroided military posture where we have so much weaponry. None at all. There was no peace dividend. I might remind you, old enough to remember, there was only an acceleration towards more war while Gorbachev was letting all the people of Eastern Europe go free, degarrisoning the Soviet military, it was the United States that went into Panama a month later after the, uh, uh, in 89 after the, uh, in 89 after the uh, Berlin Wall fell. Mm -hmm. He went into Panama to get Noriega, the, the villain of the month, the drug baron. Right. And then there was in 1991, the, after the Soviets had proven their good intentions, he went into a, Kuwait with 500,000 men in the Middle East, destabilized the entire world once again. That is not good faith. But it was a reason to keep up the military industrial complex. Right. Oh, yeah. Big money, big business. When do we vote on that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, in theory, every couple of years, but. In theory. Um, um, one of the films How can you that, vote yeah. if Obama is saying we need a strong military right. and we're crazy right. as, we, as it is, we have too much? And uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Romney is saying the same thing. How do we vote? Yeah. How, how do you vote? Yeah. Can there not be a parliamentary third party, fourth party, like they do in most civilized countries? Yeah. I think that one of the one of the really interesting films in the trilogy is the last one, the Heaven what? and Earth. Heaven and Earth. Oh, that, Heaven that, and Earth. Yeah. That that really takes a look at the at the Vietnam story from the Vietnamese point of view. Um, talk a bit about that. Uh, Heaven and Earth, uh, those of you who don't know, was written by a Vietnamese peasant woman, Lei Li Hayslip, who actually had an incredible story. She wrote two books. She uh, worked for the VC, and then she worked for the US, both sides, and then she ended up in the United States, married to an American man, two American men, had two different, three different children with three different men, a Vietnamese and two Americans. And her story I, was called Between Heaven and Earth. I called it Heaven and Earth. 
We took a young, unknown young student out of UC Davis and put her in the role with Tommy Lee Jones as one of her, one of her husbands. And it's uh, true to her story, true to her life. It's a very spiritual film. She was a Buddhist. How she survived Vietnam, but then how she survived the US. <laughs> it becomes a, uh, an interesting balance. And she has to find her way back to Vietnam and back to the, she finds the, a between place again. And she, that's why she called it between heaven and earth. She was never, never sure where she could live in this world. She was a refugee. But I think it's really interesting to, to do a film about, I, I don't know if this is the right term, but about the other side uh, that, that, that really tells this from a, from a point of view that is sort of foreign to our American sense of self and our We'll talk a little bit here in a well, minute. Well, you can't about do that again. It's very hard to do yeah. that again. I, it was a disaster, yeah. Gary. It was a disaster financially. It didn't open. Yeah. Uh, Warner Brothers was up. You know, lost a bit of money on it. But I loved that movie. I, I, I think it was so great and so beautifully shot. And a lot. The music by Kitaro was beautiful. But, yeah. you know, these things you pay for. And I, you know, I've used the power that I've gotten to try to make these. Right conflict, tough films. I made JFK in the same vein. It was not something that was easy to make. So, uh, you know, I used the power. But Nixon also was a big uh, disappointment because it didn't do well commercially, although I, yeah. I think it was admired, got Academy Award nominations. It just didn't do well because nobody wanted to see Richard Nixon any more, <laughs> any more than they wanted to see George W. Bush. Uh, <laughs> My timing was not great. What, what, do, you, what do you want? Uh, you know, actually, if, if, if I were to have bought a ticket for every time I've watched those three movies, you probably would have made lots of money <laughs> on them because I, those, I'm those actually who like big it, fans of those all Those who of appreciate all it appreciate it. But I have no, yeah. as I said, I have no, yeah. uh, no yeah. big exaggerated belief of, of their yeah. impact. I would like to talk about JFK for a minute, though, because that's, as you heard, that's the one that, that I think you're probably the best known for. Um, and and has has sparked the the probably the most amount of controversy. And I actually knew Walter Cronkite slightly, and and was with in a group with him one night. And he was just excoriating the film for its lack of accuracy. And uh, you know he was the for those of you who don't know who Walter Cronkite is, I feel like sometimes I do have to say this was the the longtime anchorman of the CBS Evening News and was sort of hard news incarnate. You know, he was an old wire service guy. He really took his responsibilities as a factual journalist yeah. uh, very seriously. And I think he was deeply, I don't know that offended is his word, maybe mine, but was really offended at, at what he saw were the inaccuracies in it. Well, I would love to sit here with Walter yeah. Cronkite and discuss yeah. it because uh, I don't think Edward R. Murrow would have agreed with him if he looked at any of the evidence. I don't believe right. that Walter Cronkite seriously looked at any book or yeah. anything or any talk yeah. to any of the witnesses and the other people who contradicted the Warren Commission. I look at Wal Walter Con yeah. Cronkite as a young boy. I remember he has a great actor with a good voice. Yeah. I don't see him as any kind of <laughs> political analyst. Yeah. But you regard, you have to look at the time. I mean, the New York Times came out, the uh, Warren Commission was released. It's a, it's a right. fountain of misinformation, thousands of pages, and they pr pronounce it within a two days. Anthony Lewis, who's also a great hero of the liberals, mm -hmm. pronounces it a, uh, right. a accurate. So uh, who's kidding who here? Uh, the, you have to really study mm -hmm. it, go into the case. This, these are facts, not conjecture. One of the things and that it, I... And by the way, Walter, how is Walter Cronkite going to come out in 1993 and say, I believe this movie? Yeah. How? and not be ridiculed. He, every newsman has a stake and a reputation. Very few newsmen are willing to yeah. risk that stake with the bold new idea. Yeah. This Kennedy assassination was so, so concretized at the time. Uh, and all I tried to do with the movie was to bring out so many of the holes, the leaks in the, in the boat, as I still do yeah. in untold history. Yeah. And maybe someday we'll see what happens, but maybe Someone so will. why did you, why did you pay put Jim Garrison as the protagonist for that? Garrison was an interesting figure, much maligned. Uh, he didn't have a huge case, but he had, because a lot of it leaked. I mean, it took two years to get to trial. Yeah. So frankly, uh, people died mysteriously, including David Ferry. But he had, the big, he had a piece of the story, because New Orleans was yeah. a figurant in uh, Oswald's life. 
Dallas was the big story, yeah. and like, we couldn't tell that story, although we did it in the movie. The movie was not about only Garrison, it was about these four stories. Right. Sutherland, Donald Sutherland is a character I met called Fle Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who was in the Air Force at the time. He was a colonel, he was, in the, uh, he was at the juncture of where the CIA was getting all its military hardware from the Air Force and all their interventions in foreign countries, including China and uh, Tibet and so forth. But uh, Prouty knew a lot, and he resigned when that happened. He knew something had st stunk up the place. A lot of people knew something was wrong. Interesting that you, that Great you story, mentioned that. But the, I can't the, go into detail. What? Yeah, the, the Donald Sutherland scene, that's the one time when I watch the film, I go back and watch it again. I just love that. Well, that's scene, based by on Prouty's dialogue great, to me. Yeah. That's a great piece of and film. And Oswald making. was played by uh, Gary Oswald, uh, Gary, uh, uh, Gary Oldman. Go, Gary Oldman. And, uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not a documentary, it's a dramatic history. Well, and that, that, that actually brings me to the one thing I really did want to ask you about tonight. And it, it, it goes to the heart, I think, of what, what we're talking about this weekend, which is, is the telling of history. And, and one of the questions I've been thinking about asking you, and I've, I've sort of thought of different ways to do it, so I'm just going to ask it this way, is does history, in your view, need to be absolutely factual? Or can you, well, or, or is there room for interpretation in myth? Because you know, I, I would argue that, that JFK is, and, and this is something that when I talk to my reporting students, I will oftentimes ask them to, you know, if they can describe to me what the story is, but then if they can tell me what the story really is. And oftentimes that, what the story really is, is, is has more of a nugget of what, what they should be focusing on. Right. Because what I think JFK is really about challenge me if I'm wrong, is really about mistrust of government. It's really about the fact that we just don't believe the Warren Commission, that we just don't believe all of those institutions out there. And, and the movie may not be, to Walter Cronkite standards, factually correct, but it really does contain a kind of metaphorical truth that oftentimes is more important or m more interesting, at least. What do you think? I, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think you're going far enough. I think you are limiting it to a metaphorical truth. It's far more than that. I mean, we worked very hard on that research. We talked to, we're probably, okay. I'm probably the only person who's talked to as many people who were still in Dealey Plaza yeah. that day as anyone. I mean, we, it, it, there were, the, our facts were good. We put out a book, sub notes and all. Yeah. And, you know, I'm willing to go with it, Cronkite or any of them against it. What you have to do is look at the documents, Look, at, talk to the people. Look yeah. at all the FOI information that's come out since the. Uh, by the way, the film was responsible for the Assassination Records Review Board, in to that's be right. formed in 1993 by Congress in order to discredit mm -hmm. the film. It ended up releasing a million pages of documents. Now it takes time to go through do through documents. I'm in touch with some people who are going through those documents. There's a lot there. There's a lot of little things there. There's no smoking gun. I blah blah. But there's a lot of information that has emerged, and uh, not only about Oswald, but about the, the plots to kill Kennedy. Much of this is covered very well in uh, Douglas's book. James Douglas wrote a wonderful book recently called JFK and the Unspeakable. And David Talbot wrote a wonderful book called Brothers about Robert and uh, Jack. And there'll be more information. So let's, you know, don't give Cron uh, Cronkite the, the benefit of the doubt. He did not spend the man hours we did. He read the news. He didn't analyze it. He read the news. Okay. Well, and I, you, 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 you know, why, why do you not, why do you not, why do you not believe governments lie? I just finished a little talk where I talked about, yeah. I grew up under the greatest looney tune of all, the conspiracy of the Russians and the Chinese yeah. coming to get us after they'd had a Sino-Soviet split in 1950. And we believed it. All our system of education was built on the conspiracy theory that was bullshit. And now you ask me to believe governments? Well, after Watergate, after Vietnam, yeah. after Korea, it's very difficult to believe our government. Why do we drop the atomic bomb on Japan? We have to open up that discussion again because it's filled with lies. <laughs> no, you're, much too, you're giving our government much too much doubt, Gary, much too much doubt, much too much credit, I'm sorry. This is a lie from a long time ago. World War II was an acceleration point in our ability to lie to ourselves. 
And that, that keeps coming back to the central question of who tells history and, and what, are, what are the best... The chief priests of yeah. American uh, respectability. Uh, would that include you? No, I'm not the high priest. The, the guys who run with the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine. You know, I think I'm sorry I brought that up. You know, And all the respectable yeah. off, uh, crooks in Congress yeah. who tell us that they really yeah. care about the public good and they send our boys to die in foreign wars. We, those are the guys who, uh, that's who, who runs this place. Yeah. Do we have any say about it? Do we have any say about our military budget? No. Yeah. Well, that, that's really what's at the heart of this project, I think. I, I was fascinated. I'm yeah. actually going to read from the... The, um, for those of you, by the way, this I believe is still on sale out in the uh, Untold History of the United States. It's, yeah, it's definitely the, uh, doing very well. Lobby, I think. We're in England. But I was really struck by something that's just in the in the foreword to the book, um, that I think really speaks to what we're talking about here, and and I think, you know, gives us some insight. I think into into your approach to this. Uh, it says that this book and the documentary film. This is uh, the first paragraph of the foreword. Uh, this, uh, this book and the documentary film series is based on to challenge the basic narrative of U.S. history that most Americans have been taught. That popular and sometimes mythic view carefully filtered through the prism of American altruism, benevolence, magnanimity, exceptionalism, and devotion to liberty and justice is introduced in early childhood, reinforced through primary and secondary education, and retold so often that it becomes part of the air that Americans breathe. It is consoling, he writes, it is comforting, but it only takes a small part of it, but it only tells a small part of the story. It may convince those who do not probe too deeply, but like the real air that Americans breathe, it is ultimately harmful, noxious, and polluted. Not only renders Americans incapable of understanding the way that much of the rest of the world looks at the United States, but it leaves them unable to act efficiently to change the world for the better. Yes, uh, well said. <laughs> I, 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 actually, I approach this humbly. I know I probably don't sound like it right now, but I have a co-author, Peter Kuznick, who's a historian of American history at American University. Right. And a, a very, very competent and an expert in nuclear, uh, nuclear war, and especially the uh, Hiroshima and Nagas, especially the early days yeah. of, the, of the nuclear threat. Uh, what we, look, I mean, I read enough history. I studied it, but I was never a historian. But I read enough of it and experienced enough through my films to know that much of it is wrong, much of it is false. So I decided to write my own. <laughs> but this is a, and I mean. Believe me yeah. when I say it is much more, ra the films are more radical than this book. This book is very nice, yeah. very footnoted. It's a thousand pages. You know, it can't do that in a film. Mm -hmm. The films get to the point, and they cut through. Please watch them, those of you who care. There's a DVD coming out in October 22. It's very important. Your kids must see this because our kids are not getting our straight story. This is upside down history. We're learning it wrong. American triumphalism. We are the good guys. We did the right thing, therefore the world, is, the world is better off for our presence. All this up to this day is allowed to be bloated into this myth. America is increasingly irrelevant to the real world because we're doing nothing about the poverty of the world. We are irrelevant to the 30 million Brazilians who've come out of poverty. We are irrelevant to the Latin Americans who have come out of poverty. We are not helping. We are hurting most of these people. And our history goes into elaborate detail on this. We've got to rethink this if we're going to save ourselves. This is quite an indictment, though. Um, we're, we're better to make an indictment than at Kent State. Right. I mean, right. what did those kids die for? Yeah. They wanted but, but, some but, kind but, of change. But, this is a real indictment of, of I don't know, of, of historians, of, of sort of the conventional wisdom, of, yeah. in a, in a yeah. way, our national image of ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Uh, how did we get to that point, and how do we fix that? Well, I look mean, where we are, and you decide yeah. whether, whether it needs reexamination yeah. or not. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need a straitjacket. Um, <laughs> frankly, if we calmed ourselves down a little bit, uh, we would do far better in the world uh, than our present posture. Uh, 
what, what do you want me to say? That yes, yes, I mean, yeah. it is because I've lived through this now that I feel confident enough to say this. Yeah. I would not have said this in 1980, 1985. Yeah. I was voting for Reagan in 1980 still, after having been through all this. Right. It was when I went to Central America and saw four countries that were being persecuted by Reagan, viciously. We were against the uh, Sandinistas who had brought this revolution to Nicaragua. For centuries, Central America had been under our domain. As recently as last week, John Kerry, our supposedly enlightened Secretary of State, referred to Latin America as, again, as our backyard. How dare he? How dare he? So uh, what I saw in Central America in the 1980s convinced me that we were on the path, once again, Reagan to war in Nicaragua, which he did. He went to war in Nicaragua using proxies in the Contras, the most brutal, disgusting, torture, torturous war. And uh, he actually won that war over time. What so here we do it again and again and again. We repress the desires for reform, change, labor reform, teachers. We yeah. repress those desires in every country on this globe. One of the themes that I've, I've picked up in, in some of the stuff that I've read about you, and, and I heard you, I believe, refer to it a little bit tonight, um, and also the, the commencement speech that I believe you gave at US, uh, USC or UCLA uh, a couple of years ago, really addressed this question of fear, of, of how uh, we're afraid, and that that may lead to some of our uh, sort of exceptionalism ideas, because that gives us this sort of protective barrier somehow. Is, is that? Yeah, that it's a real, we go into that in some depth in chapter uh, uh, four uh, during the Cold War, when the Cold War starts to shape how the American people are so easily stampeded by, uh, the Russians were our allies up uh, for, right until the end of the war, and then about two weeks after that, we're hardly, yeah. when Truman's, once Truman becomes president, we're hardly talking to them two weeks later. Mm -hmm. Everything's changed. Uh, how that happens is, of course, a great subject matter, and must be, you must investigate that because it's a great story, and that's where I wanted to start because I grew up in that period. What happened so quickly? Uh, the, uh, your question, I'm sorry, was... Uh, oh, cool. the question was about the, the you know, I, I'm really fascinated with your, your um, presumption here or your, your thesis that that we need to really challenge some of our basic assumptions yeah. of this. And, and, and I'm really interested in, in how those assumptions got there in the first place. And I, what I hear you saying in part of this is that it's because we're afraid. Oh yeah, fear. That, I know in this chapter five, we go into the immigrant history of America. You know, we, most Americans came here from other countries and they were persecuted. Many of them fled, whether it was religious or political or always coming here for asylum because we were so far from Europe, so far from right. Asia, the, the two oceans that separated us. And I think as immigrant or possibly genetically immigrant that we do have a residual fear in us of the old Europe, of old uh, Russia, of Asia. And I think that because and we band together and I, and I think we form this xenophobia, right. this American isolationism, which takes many strains of course, uh, and we turn our backs on the things of the past. We, and we band together, often in a self-righteous uh, point of view, that we're a new country, we're beyond the laws of history, we have the right. And above all, we have to keep in mind, the founding myth of our national security is the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. We were the country that dropped it. We were ruthless and barbaric enough. We, in our book, go after that myth because we show, one, that the Japanese were willing to surrender, wanting to surrender badly in the, in the weeks and months prior to the bomb being dropped, and two, that the Soviet invasion of Manchuria and Japan was a key impactful fa factor on the Japanese surrendering. And they did, not after the bomb, but after the Soviets entered that war. And what we show is the uh, United States, in fact, allowed the emperor to, con uh, the United States gave Japan the terms that they'd always sought, which was to keep the emperor. So once you, once you use the atomic bomb and you get away with it, as we did, and we call it the end of World War II, we had to do it. You, you not only insult the memory of all the thousands and 
GIs who got killed uh, crossing the Pacific, and they fought and sacrificed their lives. Uh, and they won that war against the Japanese and the Navy and the Air Force. But, but what you do when you, bomb, when you bomb and you get away with it is you think you're right. Might makes right. And then you invent your own moral code. And that moral code comes in pretty quickly. You have uh, mm -hmm. Truman talking loosely about the atomic bomb and its usage. You have Eisenhower, who had formerly been against its use, now using nuclear threats in Indochina, in, against China, in, uh, in Formo in, against in uh, the islands of Kimoi and Matsu. You have him using it against the Soviets at Suez. You have the uh, John Dull Foster Dulles is using nuclear brinksmanship. Eisenhower's policy is to reduce the uh, conventional military and use nuclear weapons as a first reaction in serious situations with the Soviets. So all of a sudden, and, and he gives authorization to blow the bomb to mm -hmm. field commanders, which is, which is why Stanley Kubrick, I think, made Dr. Strangelove, because you see the, 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 the result of this. You have field commanders who are as insane as Richard Nixon ready to drop the bomb. And what goes on through Nixon, Nixon uses threats constantly against Vietnam. According to the uh, Vietnamese foreign minister, he heard 13 nuclear threats against Vietnam hmm. from, Nick, from Nixon and Kissinger, 13. He said it didn't make a difference. We were never going to, because Vietnam stays in Vietnam, the United States would never stay in Vietnam. So Vietnam absorbed enormous casualties. They would not be defeated. And Nixon was hope, helpless. His madman theory did not work. Uh, and Obama has put all options on the table in Iran. So yeah. we're using this might, this force, as a form of blackmail against any country that doesn't go along with our point of view. It's like putting a gun to their head. It's a very dangerous position, very dangerous. And uh, it all comes from this belief in 1945 that we were right to drop the bomb. I urge you to re-examine that belief. Mm -hmm. And think about it this way. If the uh, Germans, the Nazis, had dropped that bomb instead of us, that bomb would have been stigmatized. Right. And that comes from who gets to tell the history. Mm -hmm. I said uh, th that, that fact comes from who gets to tell the history. That's right. Um, you know, we would not yeah, be speaking yeah. American if the, uh, right. if the Soviet Union had not defeated the uh, Nazis. Right. Britain would have fallen. And the United States probably would not have been able to, to, to win against the Japanese and the German empire with the Russian, with, if they had, if they had uh, taken Germany. Even, without, even if they had not taken Germany, if Russia had not entered that war, Germany was, was in great shape. It was the Soviets that destroyed the German army. So they bringing this back they, to 2013, um, if I had the power to snap my fingers, and this wonderful audience here, most of which is over the traditional college age, could, some of them quite a bit over traditional college age, could become a group of, of a full auditorium of today's college kids, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Right. What would you want them to know about what they're thinking about now? How, how would you like to, to influence or change or set on a path their mindset at the moment? As to what should they be thinking about? That protest works, that's one thing. Okay. There will be a quiz on this, by the way, so. It, it, it's not always comfortable. Those kids uh, who we're celebrating today knew that. I mean, they paid the price. That's a horrible thing that happened here. But that was a good thing, because it shook Nixon and Kissinger. They were not the same, and they admitted so that they were not able to carry out some of their plans to bomb even more extensively because of the student protests and the moratoriums that occurred in those years uh, were very effective. A million men, million person moratorium, 250,000 people here, 250,000 mm -hmm. people there. It makes a difference. Now, when Bush went to Iraq, we know that the world protested. We know we tried. Many people around the world, huge protests all over the world, probably the biggest ever, but the media certainly didn't report it to the extent that it was, should have been reported. So there was a very depressing moment for a Vietnam veteran or most people who care about these things. And 
that is part of the fear of the 2001 problem, right. you know, that our media has gone to sleep. So I urge you students, protest and get into the media and do your own reporting. Get out there and get your own blog sites and start reporting the truth about what you see. Find out. Dig. It gets around faster. It makes an impact. And it, I think, I believe in water. I believe in the power of water, inch by inch. That's the way I did platoon. I mean, you have to, you believe that you can cut away. The, the truth gets out. People are suckers for the truth. Read the book, too, because it might give you a different feel on our history. One last question. And you, you touched on this a bit in your, in your prepared remarks, but I'd like you to reiterate it again, because I think it's a good way to close what is an important weekend for us, which is the, the opening and the, the commemoration of the Visitor Center, is what should the legacy of Kent State be? Legacy of May 4th. What should we take away from it? What should we remember from it? What's the, what's the kind of Oliver Stone takeaway here? Well, in Nixon, obviously, we had a scene where Hopkins was very affected by it, and uh, it, it, uh, it didn't ultimately change the way he carried out the war in Cambodia and Laos, but it, it helped get us closer to... Nixon essentially gave the same terms to the Vietnamese in 1970. I should really say the Vietnamese gave us the same right. terms, because right. honestly, they were dictating the peace, but it forced Nixon to uh, move faster, although he was interminably slow, to uh, sign the uh, peace agreement in Paris. Uh, and it perhaps lessened the bombing and certainly destabilized them because he removed the troops in 70, 1973, the US troops, but he kept up the secret war after that. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, really, it, he, uh, he was an evil man. He was an evil man, and I, they're trying to resurrect him again. But, uh, but don't forget, as I said, and I, this, is a, this is a tough ball game, you know. He did win in 1972, the way Bush won in 2004. He did have a, quote, moral, I, th I think an immoral majority behind him. So uh, you're fighting the worst kind of scum here. The scum is in our government. This is not easy battle. And the legacy of those students, I immediately, when you said that question, I have to think about blood. Blood is the legacy. Blood and protest. Because they, this place is not going to change unless we say to the people, enough. And we have enough of this behavior. We are going to change the way we are. This has been, as I promised you at the beginning, a fascinating evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>